collective reflection and critical dialogue is, if not the only, the most important method of assessment, right? You use um, critical dialogue and collective reflection to assess your outcomes. So the next thing is to realize is that all of our outcomes, right, all of our outcomes will and must eventually undergo Right? You're not really doing participatory action research if you're not assessing your outcomes. I mean, anybody can say, oh, I'm going to go into the community and I'm going to do X. I mean, going into a community and working with people to do X is one thing. The question is, why are you doing X? What's the purpose of X? Right? Um, why is X imperative? Why should we define X as the outcome? What we do is we make, and I'm not going to get into assessments now, that's a different lecture, but you need to create a, a system of assessing the... Um, the efficiency and the effectiveness of, and I, actually I did a lecture on um, program evaluation. It's more of like a program evaluation vibe. It doesn't have to be that intense, but these are all technical words and I'm not going to get into it now. But you really want to check the effectiveness of your process, right? Your participatory action process and checking the effectiveness, and I apologize if this is a little too advanced, but I, I, I do need to finish the sentence, but in checking the effectiveness of your process, you'll recognize whether or not your outcome um, would have followed, right? This is, this is what you do in order to reflect back on your critical reflection. So the next thing to recognize is that your outcome, right, your outcomes, the efficiency of your outcome is going to be contingent on, as I said, one, and two, right, the effectiveness of your outcome is a condition of are conditioned by your critical um, uh, dialogue and collective reflection. In philosophy, we would say that one and two are necessary conditions for um, for this consequence, right? It's, it's important that if you're trying to get an effective outcome, an outcome that solves the problem, then it must be the case that before your outcome, you were engaged in critical dialogue and you critically reflected. It can be the case that you arrive at an outcome and your outcome does not solve the problem, and the reason your outcome in participatory action research didn't solve the problem is either because you weren't discussing clearly what the problem was, there might have been communication barriers, translation barriers, language barriers, whatever, or, or, or worse problems, you know, that sort of like power imbalances and so on, which would devastate your research. Or you weren't co co collectively reflecting on the process as you went through the method. This is guaranteed something went wrong in either or both of these phases, right? So it's important. All right, so um, anytime we're talking about outcomes then, right, and we're still here at outcomes, anytime we're talking about outcomes, the first thing to recognize is that outcomes, obviously, are concerned with problem solving. P -R -O -B. Outcomes require organization. None of these really require... You can have um, outcomes which, and I, I talked about this before, right, you can have outcome which which um, addresses and requires policy changes. This would be a very, very difficult outcome to implement. You'd have to be pretty, pretty far ahead in your, in your graduate study um, to get a, a, and it would be hard to get approval for policy change. Like you went in specifically to change policy because I mean that involves, you know, government regulation and rules. That's pretty revolutionary. More power to, to you if you're doing that type of participatory action research because that's about as hardcore as it gets, right? Once you get into policy changes, it's, it's heavy, and people do it all the time, but um, just know that uh, policy changes as an outcome in participatory action research, for me, is probably the hardest type of participatory action research that you can get, that you can do, uh, which is not to say that the others are not as hard, but, I mean, it's, it's a policy change, right? You're looking at very immersive, very involved, very, very time-intensive um, time, uh, research to get policies to change. Um, so we'll do policy change. And then lastly, you can have sort of awareness education uh, type. This is the type that I like the most. Right? Awareness and education. Remember when we said, uh, and this is just me, but I think awareness, um, the awareness sort of education type of participatory action research, for me, is the best, along with maybe problem solving as a combination, is the best means of 
deconstructing that hegemonic uh, imbalance in power that I discussed a couple minutes ago, right? Where there is um, a hegemonic reinforced narrative of oppression, the best way to counteract that narrative of oppression is to make people aware that we're all the same. It sounds really corny, it sounds really, really hokey, but it's just that simple. And it's just that complicated, right? We are, we are as a species, unfortunately, wedded to our biases, wedded to our discrimination. It's part of who we are, I believe, unfortunately. Um, I know people say we learn it and blah, 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 but I mean, socially constructed, but, you know, the other narrative is, no, we're pretty vile people if left without sort of government reinforcement or the threat of punishment. Um, and what you need to do is just create a counter-narrative, right? And the way that you create this counter-narrative is by spreading awareness. That's the whole point of my personal nonprofit um, as a really big sort of participatory action, ongoing research project is, hey, guess what? Genocide's a problem. You need to care about the suffering of other people despite the fact that we have our iPods and iPads and plasma LCD screens. You know, some people don't have water. They got to walk 20 miles. You should care that somebody has to walk 20 miles for water. And if it just requires you to donate $2, I mean, what's $2 going to do? Break out $2 and, you know, send somebody $2, you know, snow sweat off your back. So that's, that's you know, awareness is, awareness is you know, very important. Um, the next thing to recognize in participatory action research, I'm not going to write this down, are the emergent questions, right? The first thing, this is on uh, bottom, near bottom of page 7, research questions should, ethical claim, research questions should arise from participatory action process. Similar to grounded theory, which we're going to do after this, right? So the research questions should arise from the participatory action process. You know, you don't want to go into the process saying, I know what the problems are and I know how to address the problems. That's not how participatory action unfolds. You say, I, the way to, to sort of engage participatory action as an interested scholar, student, is to say, I've heard that there might be this problem Almost in that, that exact phrase, right? I heard that there might be this problem in this community. You go there. In fact, there is this problem, but it's much, much worse. Or, in fact, there is this problem, but it isn't as severe. Sort of this assessment, this change in, in tenor, this change in, in the situation, this condition, um, requires that the, the, the narrative that emerges from my researcher, uh, my research, arises from the process itself. The process, my involvement, is going to serve as the foundational, the foundation for my research questions, my research objective. And you'll better know what it is that you're attempting to do after you get involved in the process. Um, participants should always be encouraged to critically reflect on the research questions and emerge, um, and the emergent research question, right? Reflect on the questions. Participants is important. Both members, at least the way I teach it, both the researcher and the participant are participants, right? When I'm teaching it, when I mean participant, when I say participants, I mean both the researcher and the participant. I'm sort of Fourierian in that sense. It's the researcher, participant, the participant, researcher, everybody there needs to always be critically engaged in reflecting on um, the research questions and, and, and obviously the outcomes. What is the outcome that we're attaining? Are we getting closer? Are we getting further away? What can we do to get it? How can we do, what, you know, what did we do wrong? What did we do right? What can we do better? And so on. Until you get to a point where you've answered the problem, but it's not always the case that you're going to be able to identify the problem, especially if it's a policy change, right? You might fail in your attempt to implement policy change within the community, but you gave it the best shot that you could. And what you do is you type up your research. You say, here's what I did. Unfortunately, because of time constraints or money or whatever, I wasn't able to get it. Another researcher who's interested in maybe picking up the baton where you left off can look at your research and say, hey, you know, I read Mary's research on this community in X country, and here's what, what she did great, but she ran out of time. Let me just pick up where she left off, and, you know, that's how, you know, that's what research is about. It's us passing the baton, doing as much as we can, and then um, sharing, sharing our sources. All right. The last thing about participatory action research is that it is the recursive process, right? What is this recursive process of participatory action research? And so the recursive process of participatory of participatory action research. So the recursive process of participatory action research, one, 
um, questioning a particular issue. Right? The next thing that you want to do is reflecting on and investigating the issue. Reflecting on and investigating the issue, right? Number three, you want to develop an action plan, and in the second half, this is the first half, in the second half, I'll go into more detail on this stuff. Developing an action plan. And then number four, finally, implementing and refining the plan. Implementing and refining. So you want to implement and refine the plan as the last. So you can see that um, participatory action research um, is going to be and require quite a high degree of involvement by the researcher participant. Um, as opposed to a phenomenological research study or narrative research study, which is not to say that those require less work than participatory action research, but you're really going to immerse yourself in participatory action research project. Um, some of the benefits that you get from participatory action research is that you're there with the community, helping um, as a community. I like to say it like that instead of helping them, but you're there with the community, helping as a community to address a particular problem and arrive at some solution. And it's a deliberative process throughout. It's a collective process throughout. It requires critical um, dialogue and collective reflection. And it can be very, 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 very rewarding uh, research as a researcher. So if this is something that you might be interested in, I would encourage you to look more into participatory action research. With that being stated, I'm uh, Dr. Jason A. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video on participatory action research. Next, I'll be doing the second half of PAR, then I'll do grounded theory, ethnography, and case studies, and that will conclude um, this sort of extensive analysis into uh, an introductory account of methods of qualitative research. So, thanks a lot for watching the video. I'm Dr. Jason D. Campbell. Have a good day.